Well, good morning, everyone. Great to be with you here this morning. Hey, it's a good service to be in person for because the internet's not working. So <laughs> the live stream isn't up right now. We're going to record the message and eventually get it online. But this is one, hey, you got to be here in person. Anything could happen. I can say whatever I want and no one will ever know the difference. Um, it is Pentecost Sunday. 50 days from Easter, Uh, so it's something that the Christian church celebrates, though it's not actually the Jewish uh, Feast of Weeks. That's still coming up in a couple weeks here in June because that's 50 days from the Feast of First Fruit. So it is a Sunday, though, where many in the church are remembering and celebrating the fact that the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church. It's tradition that says it was on the Feast of Pentecost that the law was given. We know when the law was given from Mount Sinai, 3,000 people died. When the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people get saved. So the letter kills, the Spirit gives life. And so that's certainly something worth remembering and celebrating this morning. As a matter of fact, it does tie into the message that we're going to be looking at. If you have your Bibles with you, you can open them up to Daniel chapter 1. That's where we're going to be this morning. Of course, we started a study in the book of Daniel last week. If you missed that message, it was live streamed and is available online. You could go back and listen to that. Just a little introduction through those first eight verses This morning, we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 21, talking about God's favor, walking in the favor and the blessing and the goodness of God. Why don't we just come before the Lord together and ask Him to speak to us through His Word. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much that Your Word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And we do pray that it would pierce into our hearts and to our minds this morning, Lord, we pray that we would just be in a place where we have ears to hear and hearts that are just ready to receive all that you have for us. We do pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit, that you'd speak to us, Lord, and help us respond in the way that you would have us. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name, amen. Daniel chapter 1. So, of course, in the beginning of the book of Daniel, we have Nebuchadnezzar coming against Jerusalem and besieging it in 605 B.C. Daniel and his friends, along with many others, are taken captive back to Babylon to serve in the king's court. And we know something this is that God allowed because of their sin and their idolatry. Daniel and his friends, most likely in the royal line. Tradition tells us they were descendants of King Hezekiah. And they're brought back to Babylon, and they're given new Babylonian names, and they're going to be put through a rigorous three-year training process that was just as much indoctrination as it was education. They were really trying to wipe out their Jewish identity, and they wanted them to become Babylonian. They go after these young men. They were promising. Uh, They were already full of potential, but they were young, and Babylon believed that they would easily be influenced, probably around 15, 16 years old, and facing extraordinary pressure to conform, to keep their head down, just go with the flow, don't rock the boat. It's all building up to verse 8 that says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he wasn't going to defile himself in Babylon. And how the church today needs men and women with this simple kind of understanding of what it is to have a relationship with the Lord. You know, Daniel didn't seem to complain all that much when they wanted to change his name. Call me whatever you want. He didn't complain all that much when they said, hey, you're going to go through this three-year education. Okay, teach me whatever you want. Where he drew the line in the sand is when they were asking him to compromise his relationship with the Lord. He said, no, that's something I can't budge on. You can take everything from me, but you can't take my God. To be able to have that simple kind of understanding, I've decided to follow Jesus. The cross before me, the world behind me. I'm going to go with them, though none would follow to have that simple kind of understanding and relationship with the Lord. You know, the world, the flesh, and the devil wants us to live in that gray area of life where everything's always murky, everything's complicated. What's good? What's evil? What's right? 
What's wrong? What should we allow into our lives and what should we keep away? Our flesh and this worldly system and certainly the enemy would want that to be a gray area, hard to define. For Daniel, it was easy. My relationship with the Lord comes first and that's gonna be the priority in my life. And now as we finish up the chapter here this morning, we're gonna see Daniel and his friends walking in the favor of the Lord. They're gonna be walking in tremendous blessing. And of course, you can't help but connect the two. Here Daniel makes this determination right from the very beginning that he wasn't gonna compromise his relationship with God and now he's gonna be walking in this blessing. And one of the things that I hope comes through a message like this is God desires to bless his children. You know, we get glimpses of those who would walk in the favor of the Lord in the Old Testament, and certainly Daniel is one of those individuals. We see it here in our passage. We see it in Daniel chapter 9 as Daniel is praying, and the angel Gabriel comes to him, and he says, Daniel, you're beloved of the Lord. And so we get glimpses of it in the Old Testament, but for the New Testament believer, for those of us who've put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that means we've been accepted into the beloved, Ephesians says. We're the favored ones of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God, John said. Just think about how much God loves you that we would be called his children and as believers in Jesus, we should be walking in the favor and the power, and the blessing of the Lord. We can do things to hinder that favor and hinder that blessing. We can do things to encourage it. And so that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. I'm going to start reading here at verse 9. I'll read down to verse 14, and we'll get into our Bible study for this morning. Daniel chapter 1, verse 9 says, Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink, for why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. Now verse 9 says that God brought Daniel into favor and goodwill with the chief of the eunuchs. That word favor, it's sometimes translated mercy or tender mercy, it's sometimes translated loving kindness or love. That word goodwill has a similar meaning, but perhaps just on a, another level. That word goodwill in the Old Testament sometimes is translated womb, which maybe doesn't make a whole lot of sense at first until you think about the connection there. This tender mercy, this love, this compassion Goodwill, sometimes translated womb, the picture there is the way that a mother would have this unexplainable love for the child that's growing inside of her. That kind of maternal instinct, that kind of love and compassion, that's all suggested there in that word goodwill. Now think about how crazy that is. Here's the chief of the eunuchs. He's Babylonian. He's not a believer He's just this pagan idolater, and Daniel is the fresh enemy that's just been conquered and brought into the palace. Why would he have such, such deep concern? Why would he feel the need that, hey, I need to watch over Daniel, I need to protect him, I need to help him, we should show him mercy? Why does he have that kind of compassion for Daniel? It would be a mystery to us, except we're specifically told, God brought Daniel into favor and goodwill with this individual. It was something that the Lord did. God was moving on his heart in the same way that God raised up Nebuchadnezzar as an instrument of correction and discipline, so too now he's raised up this man, this servant here in the Babylonian court, to be an instrument of compassion. 
God moves on his heart. It's God's desire to bless his children. Sometimes our kids don't give us much of a choice in the matter, do they? We want to bless them. We want to love them. Sometimes they don't give us much of a choice. Sometimes the most loving thing we could do is bring correction and bring discipline. That's what was happening to the nation of Israel as a whole. God had to bring discipline. But just like an earthly parent loves their children, and though they might have to bring correction and discipline, their desire is to see them grow, is to see them flourish, is to see them experience every good thing that God has made available to them. That's our hope, that's our prayer, that's our desire. It's almost frustrating at times when we have all kinds of good things in store for our kids, but they start acting out. They start rebelling. And we're almost trying to caution them. No, 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 wait. I've got some good things planned. Are you sure you want to say that? Are you sure you don't want to go in that direction? And there are times where our hands are tied because we think, oh, well, I can't do all of the wonderful things I had in store when you're acting this way. That would ruin you. And so there has to be correction. But our desire is that they would just experience all the goodness, all the fullness, the abundant life. And we know that that's God's desire for us. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And even though the nation needed to experience correction and discipline, here's God's favor on Daniel, who's putting God first, who's saying, no, I refuse to compromise. I know why we're here. I know we're here because of idolatry, and I don't want to participate in anything that would be remotely connected to that. My relationship with God comes first, and so now here he's walking in this favor and in this blessing. And I think it's important that we stop here for just a moment and reestablish something that we were already looking at last week. And that is to simply say that this is not a story about Daniel being such a great, amazing, spiritual person that God had no choice but to bless him. It's not a story about how Daniel raised himself up and through his own good deeds and good works was somehow received and accepted by God. We have to be so careful that that kind of thinking doesn't creep into our hearts, into our minds, because it's easy to do. It's easy to be in that place where we think, if I just work hard enough, if I try hard enough, if I follow all of these rules, if I jump through all of these hoops, well then maybe God will love me. Maybe God will accept me. Maybe I can be right with him. There's something in our fallen nature that makes sense to us. When you think about other religions, when you think about other philosophies, that's really what it's all about. How do I better myself? How do I put myself ahead that I might reach that level of heaven, that I might reach that level of acceptance? We have to be so careful because the Bible is quite clear. You could never reach that level. It's not gonna happen. You can try your hardest. You can do your best, but the standard is perfection and we all fall short. That's not where acceptance comes from. That's not where a relationship with God, that's certainly not where his power or his favor comes from that we would be trying so hard. That's works righteousness, and that's not what the Bible teaches. It's not a matter of lifting ourselves up to achieve. It's about humbling ourselves and simply receiving what God has made available. You know, both James and Peter quote from Proverbs chapter 3 that says that God resists the proud but he gives grace to the humble. When we're proud, when we're full of ourselves, when we think it's about us, God is literally resisting us. But when we're broken, when we're humble, when we acknowledge our own weaknesses and the reality of the situation, then God gives us his grace and his mercy. How do we know that that was true in Daniel's life? Well, again, we mentioned this last week. We know that it was Daniel's daily habit to pray three times a day. We find that out in Daniel chapter 6. Now some time goes by from Daniel 1 to Daniel 6. But we know in Daniel chapter 6, they tried to change the law that said the only person you could pray to was the king. You couldn't pray to any other god. And of course, they changed that law to target Daniel. They knew this about him. They knew every day he would pray. 
And so they change the law to target him, and Daniel realizes, well, this is another example. I can't compromise. I can't bend on this issue. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, we read this. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, that this law went into effect, he went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since his early days. His early days. From the time that Daniel was a young boy, this is something that he always did. He prayed three times a day. But of course, there in that verse, we also read, with his windows open towards Jerusalem. He's praying three times a day towards Jerusalem, which is the fulfillment of what Solomon prayed. When Solomon dedicated the temple in Jerusalem, he said, God, if your people are ever carried away captive into a foreign land, if they would look back towards this place, if they would look back towards this temple and pray, would you hear them from heaven? Here's Daniel praying towards Jerusalem, towards the place where sacrifices should be offered. And those sacrifices were on the forefront of his mind. How do we know that? Daniel chapter 9, there's a prayer. And if you wanted to know Daniel's humility, then you would read that prayer in Daniel chapter 9. He didn't see himself as being above the correction that was coming against his people. He knew in his heart he was just as guilty. We can see that very clearly from the prayer. But it's there in Daniel chapter 9, as he's making this prayer to the Lord, the angel comes to him, and Daniel says that the angel arrives right around the time of the evening sacrifice. Why is that significant? Daniel's been in Babylon at that point for about 70 years. There hasn't been a sacrifice in the temple for 70 years, and Daniel is still measuring his day by it. He's still thinking in terms of, oh, he came right around the time of the evening sacrifice. Daniel understood, God, the reason you're hearing me, the reason I have an audience with you, the reason that I could be walking in this power and this blessing and this favor, it's not because of me. It's not because of my own righteousness. It's because of the sacrifices that are being offered. That's why I'm accepted That's why you hear me. That's why I have a relationship with you. And of course, it's what each and every one of us can do. Except we're not looking back towards the temple. We're looking back towards the cross. The ultimate sacrifice. Where the Son of God came and lived among us and died in our place. Took the punishment that you and I deserve. Took the punishment of our sin. All have sinned and fallen short. The penalty for sin is death. He took the punishment. His blood was shed for you and for me so that when we look back towards the cross, we can be forgiven. We can be redeemed. We can be accepted. When you think about it, what an outrageous statement to say that all of us here gathered this morning, that we could be walking in the power and the goodness and the favor of the Lord. How could I possibly say that when I don't know all of you? when I don't know your past, when I don't know your present, I certainly don't know your future. How could I say that, oh, I know that God has made this way available for you to walk in his favor and walk in his goodness? I can say it because of the cross, because of Jesus, because of what has been provided. Now, it's not automatic, is it? It's something that each and every one of us have to say, yes, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for dying in my place. Thank you for defeating the grave and for defeating sin. Thank you, Lord, for coming into my life. I receive this free gift of eternal life. But in the same way Daniel looked back towards that place of sacrifice, we look back towards the cross, and we can be brought into close fellowship with him. And so when we're talking about walking in the favor and in the blessing and in the goodness of God, number one, do you know Jesus? Have you ever personally received him? Because until you know Jesus, there's really only one prayer that God is interested in, and that is, forgive me, Lord, a sinner. I know that I've offended you. 
thank you for the cross and I'm asking you to come into my life. Do you know Jesus? Have you personally received him? And for those of us who've made that decision, how's our walk? Are we walking closely with him? Has something come between? Have we allowed some compromise? Have we allowed something in that would hinder the work that he wants to do? You know, Jude, in verse 21, he says, keep yourself in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Keep yourself in his love. Keep yourself in a place where God is free to work. Keep yourself in a place like a loving parent who wants to bless us. He's just free to do that. Lord, I don't want there to be anything coming in between. And so I look back to the cross. I'm asking that you would forgive me. And would you draw me close to yourself? We want to keep ourselves close to him and close to his love because God's desire is to bless his children. And we can be walking in God's power We can be walking in God's favor at work, in our career, even with unbelievers, in our community, in our church. We can be walking in the power and the favor of God. He can be orchestrating things in our life that just don't have any other explanation. You know, how did that work out? How did that door open up for you? How did God move on the heart of that unbeliever? How did he give you favor in that situation? There can be things that happen in our life where there's no other explanation. God's just good, and he's merciful, and I'm walking in his blessing. I'm walking in his favor. That doesn't mean that everything always works out the way that we want it to. I wish that it did. It doesn't mean that it always goes down the way that we think that it should. And of course, if we take a step back, how could it? How could we know what's best for us? How could we know what's best for our family? How could we know what's best in every situation, especially considering we don't know what's around the corner? So it doesn't mean that it always works out the way that we want it to, but it means that we can put God first and follow after him, and we can experience all of the blessing that he wants to bring into our life. And so in verse 10, the chief of the eunuch says to Daniel, look, I'd like to help you. I care about you and care about what happens to you, but I've been put in charge of your nutrition. Don't you realize you're coming to me saying that you don't want to eat the king's meat or the wine that he drinks? Don't you realize my life is on the line? If you start to look sick, if you start to look malnourished, I could be put to death. And so that's when Daniel comes back with this plan from verse 11 down to verse 14. Daniel says, hey, I'm asking you, put us to the test. Myself, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, put us to the test for 10 days. Let us eat only vegetables. And at the end of that time, you can examine us and you do with us however you see fit. And it says that he consented on this matter. Probably not still very excited about it. A little concerned. But again, God's favor was on Daniel. And so he says, all right, I'll go ahead and give it a try. And he puts... Daniel and his friends here to the test. Two quick observations and then we'll move on in our passage. Number one, we notice suddenly Daniel's friends are mentioned. Verse eight says that Daniel purposed in his heart that he wasn't going to defile himself. Verse nine says that God brought Daniel into favor with the chief of the eunuchs. Now all of a sudden, here's Daniel's friends that are being mentioned. And we're just sort of kind of left to wonder where exactly do they fit into that? Were they there with Daniel in verse 8 when they purposed in their heart that they weren't going to defile themselves? Were they there with Daniel in verse 9 when God brought them into favor? Or did they somehow follow? Was it Daniel's lead? We don't know the details. We definitely find out eventually in our study through the book of Daniel that there's a depth of character and conviction among these three guys. We'll see that in Daniel chapter 3. But we don't know how it all began. We don't know how it all started. We were only sort of left to speculate, but we do kind of wonder, what if Daniel hadn't taken the lead? What if Daniel would have compromised? in his relationship with the Lord? What if Daniel would have gone to his friends and said, hey, I know this is a bad situation, it's not ideal, but what choice do we have in the matter? 
What if Daniel would have compromised and not taken that lead? What would have happened? We don't know. We could only speculate. Here's what we do know. In our own personal lives, when it comes to sin or failure or compromise, it always affects other people. Isn't that the lie that we try to tell ourselves? Isn't it that the argument that we hear so many times somebody would say, oh, I don't see what the big deal is. I'm not hurting anyone. It's just a decision that I'm making for myself. Is that ever the case? It always hurts other people. It always affects other people. Usually it's the people that we care about the most. And sometimes not only does it bring hurt, not only does it bring pain and heartache, sometimes it even drags those people down in the pit as well. It always affects other people. But that's not just true in a negative sense. It's also true in a positive sense. When someone stands up for the Lord, when someone stands up for the truth of God's Word, when someone has that simple understanding, you know what? Let God be true and every man be a liar. It's the Word of God that's true. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him. When someone stands up in their faith for Jesus Christ and they're bold in their relationship with Him, that's also affecting other people. That also might inspire someone to say, hey, yeah, you're right. You know, you kind of wonder for Daniel, was it him standing and saying, no, I'm determining in my heart, I'm not going to defile myself. The effect that that would have on those around him. I think of Acts chapter 16, when Paul and Silas, it says that they were arrested and they're put into prison. In Acts chapter 16, verse 25, it says, But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. At midnight, they started praying and singing hymns while they were in a dungeon. I don't know about you, I'm always a little bit convicted by that passage because I think to myself, if I was in a dungeon, I don't know that I'd be singing. (laughs) I don't know that I'd be raising any hallelujahs or anything like that. I'd, I'd be making noise, just not a joyful noise. And I'd be wondering, God, where are you in all of this? Something that I am reminded by, though, by that verse in Acts chapter 16, it says, at midnight, Paul and Silas began to sing and pray and come before the Lord. At midnight, you wonder how many hours went by of silence? How many hours went by of despair and questioning and wondering, God, what are you doing? They eventually come to this place where they say, let's just pray. Let's just worship. And it says there in Acts chapter 16, 25, that as they started to pray, as they started to sing these songs, that the other prisoners heard them. And then there was this great earthquake and their chains break. And not only do the chains break off of Paul and Silas, the chains break off of all of the prisoners who were there. Sometimes it's one person standing up and you might be the one person in your family You might be the one person at work or at school or the community or wherever it is. You might be the one person who stands up boldly for the Lord and it's not only your chains breaking, it could be other people's chains breaking as well. They might see that and say, you know what, you're right. Now, of course, we're always ready for hard times. We're always ready for persecution. Jesus said, hey, they hated me, they're gonna hate you too. And so we understand that not everyone is going to warmly receive our relationship with the Lord, but you never know. You never know how God might use that to inspire someone else. Suddenly, Daniel's friends are mentioned. The other observation that I would make here is that Daniel, though a young man, is a young man of faith. He says, test us for 10 days. (laughs) Where did that come from? Where does he get this idea Hey, give us vegetables for 10 days and I'm sure we're going to look as good as everybody else. How did he know that? Where is this coming from? Is it just his general understanding of who God is? His character, his nature, just to realize, Lord, we're trying to put you first here. We're trying to honor you. We don't want to compromise our relationship with you, Lord. And so we're just believing that you're going to step in and you're going to handle this situation. Was it something that was more directly communicated to Daniel? We don't know. Either way, he takes a step of faith. He puts it to the test. He gives God an opportunity to work and to move. 
He says, okay, test us for 10 days and then you can examine us at the end. You know, when we step out in faith, I think it blesses God's heart. Not to say that we should be careless, reckless, we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we want to have a good understanding of God's Word, we want to be in a daily relationship with Jesus. But when we step out in faith, I think it blesses his heart. I think when Peter said, Jesus, if that's really you out there on the water, then command me to come. I just imagine a sparkle in Jesus' eye, like, wow, that's pretty awesome, Peter. Yeah, get out here. Why not? You know, I think it blesses his heart. I think of Jonathan and his armor bearer. Up at the top of the hill, there was a group of Philistines, and it's just Jonathan and his armor bearer. And he says, you know, the Lord can save by many, but he can save by few too. Let's charge up the hill. And let's just go see. Maybe God's going to deliver them into our hands. And not only does Jonathan take this step of faith, I'm always blown away by the armor bearer because you know what the armor bearer said? Yeah, that sounds good. Everything that's in your heart, yeah, let's go do it. And they go charging up the hill. They give God an opportunity to work. And I just wonder, what are some of the areas in your life that the Lord is calling you to step out in faith, step out in obedience, Give him an opportunity to work. Just see what he might do. Daniel says, test us in these things. Verse 15 of Daniel chapter 1 says, And at the end of the ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine which they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill and all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. So Daniel says, put us to the test for ten days. And at the end of that time, it says that their appearance seemed fatter in flesh and better than all of the other young men, even though they were just eating vegetables. And all the vegetarians said, amen. You know, all two of you who are here. That's why no one said amen just then, but that was a test, and now we know the meat eaters in this room. No, it's really not about diet, and there's lots of reasons to be on diets. There's lots of reasons to make certain life choices. This really isn't about diet. This is about God's supernatural, miraculous hand at work. There's no reasonable explanation to say that here Daniel and his friends only eating vegetables and everyone else is eating fatty meats, carbs and sugars and everything else and they're just loading themselves up. I mean, this is the king's table. They can have as much as they want. That at the end of that time, that not only does it say Daniel and his friends looked better, it says they looked fatter in flesh. Uh, There's no explanation for that. Maybe you could say that they seem to have more energy. (laughs) I'm sure everybody else was like, you know, kind of a little lethargic after eating all that food. But it says they looked fatter in flesh. Uh, There's no explanation here other than this is God's hand, this is God's favor, He's working, he's moving, he's blessing Daniel in this whole process. And so now the agreement is made. Okay, fine, you don't have to eat the king's meat. You don't have to drink the same wine. Apparently you guys can just get by on vegetables and it's going to be okay. Verse 17 says, As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill and all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And so here, the blessing and the favor continues. It continues, but here we're sort of given a little bit of insight into some of the different ways that God's blessing can come into our life. Sometimes it really is just a matter of receiving. Sometimes it really is just a matter of praying and coming before the Lord and He does the work. But there's other times where we have a part to play. 
where we're not called to be passive. It says that God gave Daniel and his friends insight and wisdom and all literature and wisdom and knowledge. And Daniel specifically, this ability to understand dreams and visions, but it was something that God gave them. But we also know and understand that Daniel and his friends, they were working hard. They were reading and writing and studying. They're not kicking back in a dorm room somewhere like, God's going to give us the answers anyways. What's the point of studying? That's not what they're doing. They're doing their due diligence. They're studying and they're trying, and yet it's God who's giving them this incredible wisdom and understanding. When Paul writes 2 Timothy, Timothy is pastoring the church of Ephesus. And so if he's pastoring the church of Ephesus, that means God's called him, God's equipped him, he's given him gifts, he's given him everything that he needs to be able to pastor this church. And yet that doesn't stop Paul from saying in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You've been given everything that you need you have God's calling and God's blessing. He's given you these gifts, but Timothy, you still need to study. You still need to be diligent in these things. He would write to him and say, you know God's given you a gift, so stir it up. Don't let it die out. Fan it into flame. You see, there's a part that we have to play. We're not supposed to just sit back and just wait for God to do everything. What's in front of us to do? What has God put in front of us to do as a man? as a woman, as a husband, as a wife, as a parent, or as a grandparent, as an employee or an employer. What has God put in front of us to do? We should be doing it with all diligence. We should be doing it with excellence. We should be doing it praying and saying, Lord, would you help me in this? Give me the strength. Give me the energy. Give me the insight. Give me the wisdom. I, I want to grow. I want to develop. I want to mature. Sometimes, we sort of use Christianity as an excuse to be lazy. I don't think that's what God would have for us. Uh, sometimes we act like it's almost spiritual. I'm not really growing. I'm not really developing. I'm not really maturing. But, you know, I'm content in whatever state I'm in. It's not spiritual. No, God's saying what I've put in front of you to do, you need to be doing with all diligence. Now, sometimes we say, well, you know, Paul told the Corinthians, not many wise, not many noble, not many strong. God's chosen the foolish things of this world, and that's me. <laughs> and so I'm fine just staying in that place. Listen, that's a passage I relate to all too well. I know when God called me, he was calling me out of darkness. I know when God called me, it wasn't long after I had dropped out of school. I stopped going my senior year. All of my teachers said the same thing. He's a pleasure to have in class. He just doesn't do anything. I said, what's the problem? <laughs> By your own admission, I'm a pleasure to have in class. They say, you have to do something. We had irreconcilable differences. We had to part ways. We had a different vision of what school was supposed to be all about. That's where I was. None of my friends at the time thought I was smart. None of them thought that, oh, he's probably going to be a pastor. You know, he's a very kind, spiritual person. Nobody thought that. I was down in the muck. I was down in the mire. I was down in the pit and then God saved me so I understand the passage I understand that often it is those who are brought so low they understand their need for a savior they don't struggle with that I, I get that but that's no excuse for me and it's no excuse for us to then be lazy and not be disciplined and not say Lord would you give me insight and understanding maybe it's something practical Maybe what God has given me, it's right before me, it's something practical. Lord, give me skill to understand. Give me knowledge. Maybe it's something spiritual. He gave Daniel this insight into dreams and visions. Lord, give me spiritual gifts. The Bible says that we should desire them earnestly. Give me spiritual gifts. God, I want to be used by you. And help me, Lord, to understand it's your grace, it's your mercy, it's your goodness, but help me to know What's my part to play in all of this? And I'm asking for your power. I'm asking for your strength. It says in verse 18 that after all of this time, it would seem after the end of this three-year period, they're brought in before Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 19, he interviews them. 
And he realizes that no one is like them in all of the realm. There was none found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah in all matters of wisdom and understanding. As the king examined them, he found them to be ten times better than the magicians and the astrologers who were in his realm. At the end, it's just so clear. It's not even an argument. Nebuchadnezzar brings them all in. It's like, wait a minute, these four Hebrews... These four kids from Jerusalem, there's no one else that even comes close. And I couldn't help but think, the world that we live in, so cutthroat, willing to cut corners, willing to do whatever they've got to do to get ahead. You know, how the world wants to be in this spot. Yeah, find me to be ten times better. Oh yeah, give me that title and that recognition. And the world in every sector Oh, they'll do whatever they have to do. And of course, sometimes as Christians, when we find ourselves in some of those realms, we're tempted, aren't we? Oh, we know what the rules are in church, but you don't understand out here in the real world, out here in the business world, this is how things are done. Oh, we're tempted to get ahead the way the world gets ahead by cutting corners, by not being honest, by putting other people down, cutting down our competition so that we would look better. Oh, we're tempted to do that out in the world and it shouldn't be the case. What's even more tragic is sometimes we're tempted to do it inside of the church. We're always kind of like the disciples jockeying for a position and who's the greatest and who's the most special. And sometimes we'll even resort to cutting someone else down Oh, you know, I don't want to spread any rumors, but you know, this is where he's really at, or this is what they're thinking of, or this is what they're struggling with. And we'll cut other people down to try to make ourselves look better. Listen, that's the world. That's not the kingdom of God. We can just put God first. We can honor him. And listen, he's got more than enough to bless all of us. It's not like he has a limited amount and only a a select few are going to receive his grace and his goodness and his blessing. No, there's more than enough for all of us. We don't have to cut each other down to make ourselves look better. We don't have to cut corners or try and jockey for position or make a case for ourselves. We can just seek the Lord, put him first in our life, and that's a work that he's going to do because he brings down those who are lifted up in pride, and He raises up and exalts those who would be humbled. And so, Lord, keep us humble. Help us to just have a relationship with You. Look at verse 21. It says, Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. King Cyrus, that was the beginning of the Medo-Persian Empire. And so what we're being told here in the first chapter of Daniel is not only does he outlast the king of Babylon... He outlasts the Babylonian Empire entirely. Uh, There is a longevity to his ministry. Uh, The world is always putting this pressure to conform, and here's what you need to do. Uh, The world is going to pass away. Kings and kingdoms are going to rise and fall. But the kingdom of God, Jesus, He's going to rule and reign forever and ever. And that's where our attention should be. That's where our heart should be. And so walking in God's power, walking in God's blessing. You know, if you're here this morning and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that's the first thing that needs to take place. You're not going to know God's favor. You're not going to know God's blessing. You're not going to know God's love until you get right with Him. Until you say, yes, Jesus, I want you to come into my life. For those of us who've made that decision, then it's about coming back continually, regularly. Lord, bring me to the cross. Bring me to that place where a sacrifice was made on my behalf. And now, Lord, I'm asking, would you give me the power? Would you give me the strength that I need? Lord, would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. You're my children. I love you. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. He's going to come alongside He's going to give you the power. He's going to give you the strength that you need. The Bible tells us to be regularly filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you need a fresh filling of His Holy Spirit this morning. Why don't we just come before the Lord and ask Him to meet with us. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for who You are. We thank You for Your presence here in this place. 
We thank you for your grace and for your mercy. And God, I just pray for each one here. Lord, I pray that if there's even one that needs to receive you for the very first time, for whatever reason, they've never surrendered their life to you. They've never turned from the direction that they're going in. They've never said, yes, Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. Lord, I pray today would be the day that they say, yes, Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. And I received this free gift of eternal life. And would you help me to follow you? Lord, for those of us here that know you, love you, we've made that decision, Lord, draw us close. We thank you for the cross. We thank you, Jesus, for your blood that was shed to wash us and cleanse us that we could be brought near that we could just come into Your presence and receive all that You've made available to us. And so, Lord, we pray, fill us afresh with Your Holy Spirit. Lord, give us knowledge and insight and wisdom. Lord, give us spiritual gifts that we could use them for Your kingdom and for Your glory. We love You, Lord, and we praise You. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.